Hey everybody, it's Galmadex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we'll be playing another premiere draft of the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Without further ado, let's get into our pack one, pick one here, and this pack's actually a pretty weak pack. This format has played out incredibly aggressively with a lot of premium one, two, three mana creatures, a lot of cards that hit the board with another creature token or a map token or something like that to give you a ton of value early, and this pack really just doesn't have any cards like that. The best card in this hand by win rate might even just be a nice little Wanderglyph style 2 mana 2-2 two -two that gives you some card draw going, but that is such a boring pack 1 pick 1 that I'm going to go for the card that is probably kind of weak in the format because of the general aggressive skew of it, which is the 8 mana bringer of the last gift, but it's a much cooler card, and I'm really not going to be missing much even if I end up in a red aggressive deck by not having that 2 mana 2-2. Two -two. Whereas if I do get to play green black or blue black descend, one of the very few nice defensive archetypes in the format, having a big top end bomb like the bringer the last gift is going to be a huge boon to my deck. So we'll start with the bringer of the last gift here. For pack 1 pick 2, we have Amalia Benavides Aguirre as the next rare, which is great if you have a ton of life gain, but there's not a lot in the format. There's a couple life linkers, but all the good life linkers are pretty heavily contested. They're pretty high picks, like 1 1 flying lifelink creatures. So I don't think I take Amalia here. We might take a green card trying to head towards green black descend, or we could take a blue card towards blue black descend. I think those are the best archetypes for the bringer because you want to fill your graveyard with a bunch of stuff before you resolve this thing and you want to be good at stalling out the game and both those archetypes can do that we can take brontaton as a cheap high toughness creature or the iceberg to fill our grave and draw us a card early and i'm going to go for the iceberg i think i like blue black descend a little more than green black descend and the iceberg's a great card for that archetype giving you card advantage early and flipping into a big 6-6 six -six to help stabilize late for pick three now, Ultek Cloud Guard, definitely the strongest card in the pack by win rate. A four mana three two flyer that also spits out that gnome token for you. We could take that and try to head towards probably blue white being the ideal place to be. There's a lot of artifact synergies in that color pair, and I think it's a lot stronger than the black white color pair. So there's Cloud Guard, which might be the pick during like an arena open. But there is a pretty premium black removal spell with Join the Dead here that can keep us to the path we're currently on. Or we could take a Visage of Dread, which is also a pretty good card, being able to rip something out of your opponent's hand and then flip into a big creature later. Again, the big flaw of this kind of card, similar to the flaw of the Bringer, is that it doesn't do a ton until very late in the game, so you need a lot of support from cheap removal spells like Join the Dead to get it to really work, so I think I'd rather make sure I have plenty of cheap removal to stay alive before I start taking too many more big, grindy late-game spells. So we'll grab the Join the Dead here. For pick four now, there's a Waterwind Scout, which is one of these great cheap creatures with the value plays of getting tokens on board, very similar to the Cloud Guard, but this one is on color to our blue-black descend deck, so I'll definitely take it. Very similar to uh, the last pick where I'm taking the Join the Dead over the big powerful six drop kind of visage, I'm taking the uh, Waterwind Scout over the big powerful five drop, great mistake here. Really cool payoff for a descent deck but you got to get all of your early mana value cards, your cheap creatures to trade off, your cheap interaction. Uh, you've got to be prepared for some aggressive stuff in this format before you start going after your big late game insanity, unless there's literally nothing else in the pack like there was in the Bringer's Last Gift pack. So let's take the Waterwind Scout here. Be pretty happy with it. This is an incredible common, one of the strongest commons in the entire format, and it fits well into every single blue deck blue-red, blue-white, blue-black, blue-green, you name it. For pick five, we could try to splash in a Master's Guide Mural, I guess, for another kind of big grindy win con, but I think we should be able to find plenty of those in our current color pair, and I'm a pretty big fan of the Staunch Crewmates. It's going to be a little weaker in this color pair. There's not many pirates in black. I actually don't know if there are any. There might be like one random uncommon or rare that I'm not thinking of, but there are plenty of blue pirates and plenty of artifacts in the set, and if you can draw a card off of this when it hits the board, it is very, very solid value. We could also take Sage of Days if we just want to fill the grave a bunch for Descend stuff, but we don't have much. We just have the Bringer right now. 
And I don't think that card's that great. I'm going to take the crewmate here, but it's crewmate versus trying to splash in a guide mural or potentially pushing towards blue-white for the guide mural there. And for pick six, we get a nice easy pick, another inverted iceberg, which is great for these grindy decks. Yeah, we'll scoop that up. Some solid red aggro stuff with a Wanderglyph here and an Atali's favor. I haven't been overly impressed by the Gold Fury Strider. It's been fine, but it is a lot of mana and a lot of tapping to get your damage through with that. Pick seven now. This is a pack where it's starting to get more reasonable to maybe start taking the Sage of Days. We're probably the only deck in the entire draft pod that can really use the card. Uh, so I feel like we can get that super, super late. So we might want to just take more cheap interaction like Brackish Blunder to slow our opponents down. Bounce their creature, maybe get a map token if it's a tapped creature we're bouncing. I'll take the Blunder over the Sage. Pick eight now, there's a dead weight, which is really, really nice for these slower decks because you want to have that cheap, efficient removal. And this is cheap, efficient removal that also fills your graveyard for your Descend cards. The Descend archetype, of course, wanting a ton of permanent spells in your graveyard. Well, permanent cards, lands do count as well, uh, but enchantments count too. So if you kill their two toughness or less creature and put a permanent in the grave at the same time, you're fueling your deck pretty well while helping yourself stay alive. So very happy to take dead weight. For pick nine, Hurl into History is incredibly narrow and it plays super bad in a pretty aggressive matchup. If our opponent's on one of the aggro decks that's playing like 5-1 drops, 5-2 drops, and so on, we're going to be holding up a 5-mana spell to maybe counter a 1 or 2 drop later in the game sometimes. Just uh, really, really narrow, just not the greatest. We could take the Skull Taker, but that's really slow. The Boulder's also really slow. Just not a very good pack. I'm not a fan of counter spells in this format in general. Any format with a pretty low curve makes your counter spells much, much worse. And we're in a color pair where we can just play actual removal for stuff that is resolved, like Join the Dead or Dead Weight. So for pick 10, we could take the Cartographer's Companion. Didact Echo is theoretically good value because it does draw you a card when you play it, but it is such a small body in terms of power and toughness for the mana cost that it always trades so far down into like a one or two mana creature that I don't think it makes up for that with the card draw you get when it enters the battlefield, so I'm not super excited about that. Here for pick 11, I am pretty excited to wheel the Visage of Dread, get that two for one going, immediately rip our opponent's best creature or artifact out of their hand, and then if we make it to later in the game, we've basically drawn into a six mana, five, four menace to try to close things out. Just some early disruption that doubles as a win condition later. Take a Compass Gnome here, although I don't think it's very likely. This is just the kind of card, if we end up maybe taking a Master's Guide Mural and trying to splash it in, this can help do that. But we did not take one yet. Now I can take a Sage of Days, although Gnar is also just okay. These are both super, super filler on the lower end of filler. But if we end up with a ton of cards that get better with Descend 4, Sage of Days is a great way to do that off of just one spell. Because you can play this mill 3, and then once you trade it off on blocks, you'll have another permanent in your grave, so if you manage to mill three permanents off the end of the battlefield trigger, that card can single-handedly enable to send four cards. So that can be pretty cool. The big flaw being that if you don't care about Descend, or if you just don't draw into any of your Descend cards, it's kind of like a three mana three two with no abilities, which is real bad. So pack two, pick one now. We probably have to just take Zoetic Glyph, a three mana five four that discovers three when it dies is an insanely good deal. And it's not hard for this to be that. You just have to have an artifact on board to do it. And in this format, even though we're not blue white artifacts or blue red artifacts, where it's incredibly easy, we still have Blunder to get a map, two Icebergs that we could animate, a Compass Gnome we could turn into a 5-4, another map token from Waterwind Scout, maybe a Companion or a map token from the Companion. We already have plenty of artifacts to work with this thing, so I'm still going to take it here. Now, the Throne of the Grim Captain's a really fun one that can work in the blue-black color pair, but I'm hoping Zoetic Glyph is the kind of card literally every blue deck in the format can use well, but that Throne of the Grim Captain is 
basically just unplayable if you're an aggro deck. So I'm hoping we might be able to get the Throne of the Grim Captain to come back around to us through this draft pod, say nobody else takes it, and then we get to scoop it up and try to go for that as another win condition. Here we can go ahead and take the Starving Revenant here. Very, very simple, just solid value card. 4 mana for a 4, for when it hits the board you surveil 2. For each card you put on top of your library, you have to draw a card and lose 3. So if we haven't got a great early defensive start, that can be really painful to try and draw any cards off of it. But it also has a really great descend ability if we fill our graveyard. We get 8 permanents in there, then we start draining our opponent for life every time we draw a card. So... Big fan of the Starving Revenant. We'll take that here. Maybe try to get a Skullcap Snail or a Fanatical Offering back. I think those would both be solid for this deck. For pick three, we see another Zoetic Glyph, which is fantastic. We will scoop that up, add it to the deck. Geological Appraiser is another incredible Discover card. A four mana, three, two, and you cast another three mana value or less card at random from your deck. There's also a Braid in red. Really good red stuff here, but it's only pick three. So... The uh, the red drafter could have just taken the rare, and then that just means one of these two players isn't in red if there happened to be a red rare in this pack. So not even the most massive sign for red when we're only three picks into this pack. And I'm pretty committed to our blue-black grindy deck here. So let's grab a Zoetic Glyph here, move on to pick four. Now we have got not much. There's another Sage of days, which I guess we do now have a big Descend 8 payoff. Uh, Song of Stupefaction, I'm very much not a fan of, but I guess if we really, really, really need to put cards into our graveyard, we can do that. One thing I do like about the Brine Fang, while it's generally not a very good card, if we get the Throne of the Grim Captain, these land cyclers are the way that you get dinosaurs into your blue-black deck. So you can cycle it into your graveyard, and the Throne of the Grim Captain wants you to have a dinosaur, a pirate, a merfolk, and a vampire in your grave. So the Island Cycler and the Swamp Cycler are the only dinos on color, so maybe that. Just speculating towards that. Or the Hidden Cataract, since we're a slower deck. I don't know, they're not super pumped about that pack. Pick 5, though. I think the Braided Net is a pretty nice defensive card. 3 mana for an artifact with 3 net counters on it. You can tap it and remove one of those to tap a non-land permanent, and uh, its activated abilities can't be activated as long as it remains tapped. Mainly, it's just going to be like an Ice Manipulator, where you're tapping their best attacker three turns in a row. Then you can craft this with an artifact to flip it into the, uh, the braided thing, braided kipu, I guess. Uh, and draw some extra cards off of it and put it back into your deck to draw it again later. So mainly just a really good way to slow things down for a bit, stall things out. And pick six, we've got a Bitter Triumph now for excellent cheap removal. Happy to take that. I'm also not uh, opposed to Frilled Cave Worm in these blue-black Descend decks because they can relatively consistently be a 4-5 for 4. There's also Mephitic Draft if we just want more artifacts in the deck for our double Zoetic Glyph, could, which could definitely be an argument but I'm going to take more cheap, efficient removal with Bitter Triumph. Pick seven. We've got counterspells that I consider unplayable just because they're counterspells, or an Acolyte or a Skullcap Snail. Let's grab that Skullcap Snail, get our one-for-one one value the second it hits the board, and then get a chump off of it, fill our graveyard for Descend. Speaking of filling our graveyard for Descend, one of the best ways to get to Descend 8 is the Waterlogged Hulk, it is abysmally bad in any deck that doesn't care about Descend at all, but in this exact kind of archetype, it does find some work. Same with the Stinging Cave Crawler. It's fine in this exact archetype and terrible and everything else. It's actually kind of hard to pick between the two. I guess I take the Cave Crawler. It's a little better up front, even if we don't get the full Descend which is pretty nice, and if we do, and we can clear a little bit of a path for it, it can take over the game with some card draw, so I think those are both really nice to send cards. Here's another Sage of Days we could take to fill that grave, or Cartographer's Companion we could take for more artifacts for the glyph, but I'm going to take a Sage of Days here. More on that Descend path. Now we get a Fanatical Offering, which does make a map token when we sack something to it. And the rest of this pack is probably ded dedicated to some filler spells that are just going to get cut out of the deck in the end. 
And then we will have one final pack to improve this deck. We already have 25 playables because every card we took pretty much is on color. We're going to end up with zero caves here because I just keep taking non-cave cards over them. Which is a little awkward. I think basically every aggro deck in the format doesn't really care about the caves at all. But being a slower deck like this, we could actually use uh, the caves perfectly fine. But I have passed up on every opportunity I had to take them. So pack three, pick one. We see another Amalia, which is not really going to happen in this deck. We've got an Oaken Siren, which is great for ramping into... Um, big artifacts or big craft abilities because it does work on their abilities as well so it can help flip our icebergs which is nice um it can help cast our boulder if we keep that in the deck it's also a great card to put the zoetic glyph onto but i feel like the iceberg itself is also just another great card to put the the glyph onto while working with our descend half of the deck better we don't have a ton of artifacts to dump uh, Siren Man into. I think Iceberg is probably just a little better for this deck. It might be a little more likely to come back around than the Oaken Siren, but I still think uh, neither are too likely to come back, so we'll take the one that's just better for this deck. Oh, speaking of things coming back around, we didn't get that Throne of the Grim Captain, which makes me very sad because I highly doubt whoever drafted it is in a color pair they can actually flip it in, so I'm sad. If we did get it, then there's another dinosaur, which would be awesome. But we didn't. Could still take this just for a land cycler. I think I'd rather just grab the cave this time since I keep passing them up. Yep. Scoop up a cave here, I guess. For when we're flooding out in the late game, give us something to do. Pick three, another iceberg. All icebergs all day. Plenty of things to turn into five fours with our Zoetic Glyphs that way, and plenty of big six sixes in the end game. Pack three, pick four now. With enough little Sage of Days, like, yeah, two Sage of Days, four Iceberg, enough incidental mill like this, the Terror Tide can probably actually work as a board wipe relatively early. A lot of decks where it can't, and that makes it kind of weak in those archetypes, but here I think we do have the work put in towards this deck towards getting this to actually be a board wipe that can help us against aggro, so let's take that here. And now Deathcap Marionette's a great way to fill that grave here. Let's add it to the pile. Also trades up into anything it blocks. We are probably slow enough to be interested in Malicious Eclipse against aggro. The issue with this, of course, being that not every single deck is aggro. I still think enough will be that the Eclipse will be a nice way to try to stay alive. Over the Visage here. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to take the Eclipse here. We'll see how it plays out. It might end up being pretty weak, but... I just think with the amount of solid aggro decks, the card can be pretty great. Take a Skullcap Snail now. Although... A little interested in taking a look at the amount of removal we have. We have two board wipes. A 4-mana and an 8-mana board wipe as well as the three mana board wipe small things with the Eclipse. Yeah, even if I only have like three or four removal spells, the quantity of board wipes probably means I don't need the five mana Ray of Ruin that much. So we'll take the um, the other spell there. Pick eight now, another Mephitic Draft, so we have more things to put a Glyph onto, or Waylaying Pirates, which is a solid way to slow things down at four mana. I don't have a lot of four drops here, and the ones I do aren't that great. The Mycoid, making one ones that can't block is just not helpful for the kind of decks that are actually descending consistently, because all you really need to do is be blocking. Uh, Puzzle Door now, probably okay. Yeah, it's a filler little early card draw spell, but it's a fine one because it is going to get a permanent into your graveyard when you cast your card draw spell, so adds to that descend count. Ooh, pick 10 Miner's Guide Wing. It's part of why the format is super aggressive, all the little 1-mana one 1-1 one, one flyers you can throw plus 1-plus one, 1 counters onto that get passed probably much later than they should. And I was definitely guilty of that week one of the format because uh, 
there are so many cool late game things in this format that they're all so tempting and you tend to like build around the cooler cards in the format and then you end up passing all the little aggro dorks and it turns out all those little aggro dorks are just pushed enough that uh, aggro is just super super strong in the format again as it has been most of the year we have so many options for this deck as you can see, blue-black grindy descend stuff just being wide open. Probably because everyone is drafting much more aggressive decks that are going to try to steamroll me before I do any big late game plays. But hopefully we've got enough defenses for the early game that we have a reasonable matchup against the kind of decks that were being drafted in this pod. I guess it doesn't matter specifically being good against the decks drafted in this pod since we'll be paired against random people from all different draft pods. But that is kind of the meta of the format in general as well. So we have 55 cards in this deck. We get to cut 15 cards and really focus up on whatever kind of uh, archetypes and synergies we want to lean on here. All right, so we have a few different synergies that we're really trying to hit critical mass for. One of them is definitely the double Zoetic Glyph. Getting a 5-4 for 3 mana that also discovers when it dies is incredibly powerful, one of the strongest cards in our deck, but we have to put in the work to get it going and make sure that we have enough artifact permanence to put this spell onto. Even if we're not going to be getting super aggressive with it, just having that to trade off on blocks draw us another card off that discover is going to be a big big deal so we definitely want to make sure we have enough artifacts or artifact tokens to keep that going here so we'll keep that in mind as we're cutting some artifacts and alongside that artifact synergy we also have the staunch crewmate that's going to want to have at least 10 other targets in the deck to hit for it to have about one out of every four cards in the deck being something that it can draw into so that this is consistent enough to still be decently playable. If you miss on this card, it's a 2 mana 2 1 with no text, which is pretty dang bad. So you want to hit a decent portion of the time, which I would say is about 10 or more cards that it can hit. So we'll keep that in mind as well. Another thing is that with the bringer of the last gift, we want to make sure that when we cast this, we have a better graveyard than our opponent in terms of what creatures are in there. So we do want to try to keep an okay creature count, even though a lot of what we're going to cut here is probably going to be some early game creatures. I think we do want to keep at least like these land cyclers because these can help us get to the eight mana for our bomb, as well as putting another permanent into our graveyard for all of our descend cards and putting a big six mana creature in the grave for the binger, bringer of the last gift to reanimate so there's that synergy as well there's a lot of things that our deck is trying to do here we're filling the grave and we're playing a lot of artifacts i guess those are the two main things so not an insane amount of things to keep track of but it is definitely going to be a little more difficult than your average deck where there's only like one core synergy you need to make sure you have enough cards for like if we're blue red we're just like all right let's just make sure we have a ton of artifacts but here it's like okay we want a lot of self mill a decent creature count, and a lot of artifacts. So a lot of things to balance out here. So 15 cuts. First off, think I'm going to drop the Runaway Boulder. Six mana removal is incredibly inefficient, especially in a deck that has a 3, 4, and 8 mana board wipe at that point. So let's cut the Runaway Boulder. In the Fittic Draft, we don't have a lot of ways to sacrifice this card so that we can put it into the graveyard from the battlefield and draw another card off of it. But we could put a glyph onto it and try to trade it off. So I'll stack it up alongside the glyph here. But I'm going to look through the deck, see if there's any other ways to put this into the graveyard, any other ways to sacrifice it real quick. And if there aren't, if the only way really is to trade it off with the glyph, uh, then it might not be great. Yeah, we have one fanatical offering. We could sack it to draw to and get a map. But we've got plenty of other cards that would be OK with the offering. And then we have one Acolyte of Aklazots, which I think is basically just only good with our Mephitic Drafts, so I think I'm going to end up cutting this card anyway. So, I don't know, I'm not thinking the Drafts are super going to work out here. Would be very sad if the Glyphs don't work out, or like the Crewmate doesn't work out. Let's see, what would happen if I cut the Drafts and the Acolyte? 
Um, the compass gnome, we'd want to cut that since we don't have a third color to pull out, so it's just very filler. Cartographer's Companion doesn't do a ton for the mana cost, we'd probably want to cut that out. Hoverstone Pilgrim's really slow, it just saves us from milling out, but we're much more scared about just getting aggroed out than milling out, and a 5 mana 2-5 is pretty expensive, pretty slow against those kind of decks, so it's not going to be that helpful there either. And I think that's it, I think we keep basically every other artifact in this deck. So that puts us to seven artifacts and one other pirate, so that's eight cards the crewmate can hit. Probably too low for the crewmate by a little bit, but the glyph, it is important to keep in mind, can use artifact tokens as well, not just full-on artifacts. So we have seven artifacts to work with the glyph, but we also have a map token from Fanatical Offerings, that's eight, a map token from a blunder potentially putting us to 9, a map token from a water wind scout putting us to 10. So about one out of every four cards in our deck can give us something to use the glyph on, which I think is enough to still run it here because of how powerful it is when it does actually pop off, when it does actually work out for us. So we'll keep that here. Uh, our curve is pretty slow when you treat the icebergs uh, kind of how I like to treat them, which is basically a 6-mana six 6-6 six, six that has a 2-mana adventure to draw a card. So we have plenty of top end here, which is nice. Um, I think we can cut, like, the Mycoid, because, again, those 1-1s one -ones that can't block are really just not helpful. Is there anything else on the creature curve that looks super bad? No, I like the Marionette. I like the uh, Sage of Days for that, uh, that self-mill there. Maybe we don't really care about one for one little advantage off the skull cap snail. Still think I need something to just turtle around with early to have some blockers. Six more cards to cut. That's how it looks right now. Mill two, return two creatures from your grave to hand. This is Pretty slow, doesn't directly impact the board, it's just a card draw spell in the late game. Might want to ditch that. This is a lot of cards to cut. Yeah, Skullcap Snails actually just aren't hitting any synergies. And we have so many different things we're trying to get going with the Descend and the Artifact themes that I don't think I can be like cutting icebergs and then having to cut the glyphs over cutting snails here that are just solid cards for the mana value, but don't actually do anything super synergistic. And then Waylaying Pirates is kind of the same. Just a stun card for that four mana. We can play a pretty low creature count with two board wipes between Terror Tide and Bring of the Last Gift. Or three with the Eclipse, too. So that's four cards cut. We're at 42 now. We do have enough self-mill that... There's a slight argument to running more than 40 cards so that we never mill ourselves out, but I don't think we have enough self-mill that that's going to consistently be milling us out. I think like there's a chance we might lose like one game to milling ourselves, but I think it's a pretty low chance. I think we're probably supposed to still go for a 40-card deck here. This is kind of like land 17, 18 when we're spending the mana into them, which I do like with an 8 drop and with a lot of cards that want these permanents in our grave. I mean, we could just cut the double glyph and go full in onto the, uh, the descend synergy, and then we can actually make some other choices with our cuts, moving some of these artifacts out of the deck for maybe the snails and stuff. It might end up with a better build of the deck. But I have been very, very, very impressed with the Zoetic Glyph lately. We played it in, I think, a blue-red and a blue-black deck, and it was phenomenal in both. I don't remember the exact colors, but played it a couple times, and it's been insane. I mean, let's see what we've cut out of the deck. Is there anything that looks like we could add some really powerful other synergies in by dropping... Glyphs, because by dropping glyphs, we could cut maybe an iceberg or two to throw some other stuff back in. I don't think there's anything that insane that we ended up cutting here. I mean, we could cut like the two glyphs 
and two icebergs and put the skull cap snails back in. So we have more blocks early in the game. It's like about it. Maybe a little bit more self mill with another chance or something. Throw the fanatical offering. Wait, why is there one up here? I already have one in my deck. Oh, I have two offerings. All right, well, I probably only want one. But that is interesting to note. We have two fanatical offerings. I guess I could put the Hoverstone Pilgrim back in as a backup plan, make sure I never mill out, but I don't think that'll be a thing. I'm actually not sure, now that I think of it, how great the Braided Net's going to be either. Because against, like, red, white, blue, white, just like white, red, and blue, any of the Jeskai color aggro decks, a lot of what they're doing is getting a bunch of one, two, three mana creatures onto the board rather than getting one really big threat to keep tapping down. So I actually don't know that Braided Net's actually that helpful in most matchups. I'd love it if this were a best of three draft, then we can pull it in against Dino decks. Be right, really good there against decks that are resolving like one big spooky threat, but I just don't know that that's what a lot of these decks are doing. Which is then me cutting another artifact, which makes the glyphs a little weaker again. Yeah, I think I could do like braided net, drop the double glyph, and put back in one of the snails for another chance or something like that. Let's put a snail back in. Have one more early little chump blocker. But I think we'll ditch that kind of artifact theming in the end and be full defensive stuff here. Multiple board wipes. Closing the game out with some big creatures later. Maybe even just resolving a 6, 7, and a 5, 6 or something then. So, yeah. Plenty of 6, 6s as well. There's four 6 mana 6, 6s in this deck uh, as well, which is a big deal. Now, this is looking very interesting, very solid. We have 13 black spells, 10 blue, so we've got 9 black sources and 8 blue. Seems correct to me let's call it a deck here all right here we have a look at the finished deck list for today we're on a blue black descend control deck a very grindy kind of archetype and we've got multiple board wipes and removal spells to try to use to stay alive with terror tide malicious eclipse join the dead dead weight and brackish blunder to be using on our opponent's early aggro stuff to stick around to the late game and hopefully just play some bigger stuff than our opponent. We have the Bringer of the Last Gift to clear out the board and then reanimate everything in every graveyard to the battlefield. We've got a couple land cyclers which can help us get to the 8 mana for the Bringer of the Last Gift, as well as shove some big creatures in our graveyard to be reanimated by it. We've got a lot of solid 2-mana value plays, the Icebergs drawing a card and milling a card, the Visage ripping a card out of our opponent's hand, and these value plays also turn into 6-mana win conditions. This one turning into a 6-6 six, six that gets to untap something every time it attacks, and this one turning into a 5-4 Menace that mills 2 when it hits the board or attacks. So some big finishers there as well, plenty of big late game creatures to end the game as long as we can make it there. And as you can see, we have board wipes, removal spells to help get there, as well as a good amount of dirtily little creatures to trade off early, a few death touchers with death cap marionette and stinging cave crawler, and some nice ways to fill the grave with sage of days and a little bit of explore with the Waterwind Scouts map token as well. So pretty fun stuff, pretty cool stuff here. One of the biggest flaws of this deck, I would say, is the amount of non-permanent spells in it. We do have one, two, two sorceries, and four instants. So we have seven cards in this deck that are not permanents, which means that getting to like descend eight for the Starving Revenant will probably be pretty difficult. But I do think we have enough self mill between all of our icebergs and our death cap marionette and uh, even the Revenant to an extent that mills ourselves and definitely the two Sage of Days. I think we have enough self mill to get to the descend four that we need for the Stinging Cave Crawler to be a very strong card and easily enough to send to make the Terror Tide a uh, decent board wipe by the time we cast it. 
So again, kind of a high non-permanent count for a Descend deck, but we don't really have that many Descend payoffs. The only really important ones are the Cave Crawler and the Terror Tide, and I think we have enough self-mill for those cards to get around the fact that we have a lot of instants and sorceries that might end up in the grave as well. So really solid, really fun looking to deck today. Definitely something pretty interesting. Excited to see how it plays out as we head into the gameplay. Here we are for game one on the play. We get that puzzle door down to use on turn two. We've got an eclipse if our opponent is trying to aggro us out. Liking this hand a lot. We've got the big late game with a revenant and a brine fang. So let's drop the puzzle door next turn, probably cataract and draw a card. Although that makes it so I can't eclipse till turn four, but that's probably fine. We usually want to wait a little bit so that they get some more creatures on board before we use this anyway. Okay, blue deck that has a cave in it. If they are playing a cave, they might not be the most aggressive deck in the world. Let's see what we find off the puzzle door. Islander or Swamp. It's our second black source or third blue, so let's grab the second black for the Malicious Eclipse. But again, we're not playing that next turn anyway. So I'm just going to get my tap land out of the way. Blue-green is the color pair. A very good value archetype. A lot of exploring going on in that color pair where they can be drawing lands off the top or surveilling to hit whatever they need. So that's pretty nice. With the explore mechanic off of map tokens that let any creature they control explore, they can get some plus one plus one counters onto their flyers like Oak and Siren. So that's a thing as well. To keep track of here. If they do resolve one or two more two toughness cards, I might just pop the Malicious Eclipse before they potentially buff that Oak and Siren at all. With map tokens and stuff, that is a three toughness card, so Eclipse already looking very sad, just killing one Oak and Siren at this rate. Yep, and there's an Axe Draw. Alright, green deck's probably the one <laughs> matchup where Eclipse is pretty bad. Because they are going to have the most creatures that don't die to it. So I have Starving Revenant. I am at 19 life here, so I can take a hit. I probably don't want to draw two off of it, but I think playing this and drawing like one, milling one is probably fine. Let's get the Revenant down. Okay, well, if those are the hits, we can just mill two. And I think that's fine. I do have a seven drop in my hand, but... I have a, a payoff for getting to 8 permanents in Grave on the board, so there is value to putting these in the Grave as well, even if we're trying to get to 7 mana sort of here. Next turn I have the mana to play a Sage of Days and a Fanatical Offering. I don't think I'll be casting a Fanatical Offering anywhere unless they're going to kill one of my creatures, then I can respond by offering it away, sacrificing it before it dies and getting the extra value off of it. But uh, we'll see. Alright, they're just going to final strike the Revenant, hit me for 5 here, fair enough. There's a Cave Crawler, which is fully active. It's pretty cool. Can't get through their Kin Caller. But I could play it this turn, then I could Eclipse next turn, and then the Kin Caller's... What, that'd be a 1-1 one, one versus an 0-1? Oh, nope, that wouldn't work. So I can't get an Eclipse attack with it or anything. Could draw one card off of it and trade it into the Kitten Collar, which isn't the worst deal in the world. Probably just want to do Sage of Days, try to trade that into Kitten Collar, and then Offering. If we need it. Spike Tail for 6 drop to draw into. Inverted Iceberg is also a 6 drop but it's a 6-drop that fills the grave and draws us another card. I'm going to take the Iceberg here. Probably just start using our card draw, just trying to dig into our Bringer. Because if we resolve a Bringer, that's going to really win the game with how much we're filling our grave here. We only have two creatures in there right now, but they're big enough to be massive. If we kill everything on board, and then we get a 4-4 four, four, and a 5-6, but they get nothing... 
that's going to be a win condition from the bringer of the last whatever. Bringer of the last gift, I think it was. Our opponent is milling themselves now, though, with this in the presence of ages, so if they end up with any creatures in grave, they're going to get something out of the reanimation if we find our bringer. And they're mainly digging for a land here, I imagine. They get one land, one creature of their choice. Yep, there is going to be one creature in their grave after this, and it's going to be Nikamzeel, Current Conductor. Well, I'm happy they picked a Waterwind Scout. If they don't manage to explore a counter onto that, that will die to Malicious Eclipse. And we might actually kill two things with it, which I think is the breaking point for me, where I'm finally just going to cash it in. If I can kill two cards off of it. I can play Cave Crawler and hold up the Offering, or I can play the Iceberg and hold up the Offering. I'm going to play the Iceberg, hold up the Offering. Mill the Marionette, draw the Bitter Triumph. Bitter Triumph is not a bad draw at all. Do you like having that available? I guess I could attack with the Sage. Then I have to hold the Cave Crawler up on blocks, which I really don't want to do. I think I'm just saving the Sage to block this Kin Caller all day long. Is it worth it to offering and sacrifice the Iceberg? Probably not, when we're one land away from making the Iceberg a 6-6. Like, I can't be all in on just drawing my Bomb Rare. I should have an alternate path to victory here. Please have a land on top of your deck. Oh, RNGs is so rude. It's kind of surprising they don't here. They have missed a lot of land drops. But that does make it so that is out of reach of Malicious Eclipse, and it is still only going to kill one card. I mean, it'll kill our own Sage of Days as well, so it kills one card from both players, which makes it really bad on this board. Send in the kin caller, please. No, we will never get a trade. Okay. Probably have to cash in a bitter triumph on the Waterwind Scout. Keep that damage off of us. Yeah, I imagine so. I guess alternatively I could Island Cycle the Brine Fang and just flip a 6-6 six, six here, take 4 damage next turn, go down to 9. It's not a death sentence. Do I have an artifact in Grave? Yep. Puzzle Door, so I can craft this. Yeah, let's just guarantee the craft here, just take the flying damage next turn. Ooh, hello Terror Tide. Minus 9, minus 9 to everyone? That is interesting. They have a lot of cards in their hand, so they're not just going to scoop to a board wipe here. But is it still worth playing right now? I could offering away my Sage of Days since it would die anyway and then board wipe, which is probably actually pretty worth it. Still have a Bitter Triumph and a Malicious Eclipse for other stuff later. I actually genuinely think that's probably a solid line here. Well, I guess I can declare an attack here. They might not block, and we get three points of damage, and then we offering in Terror Tide. All right, get our th three free points of damage and then do our thing. Cool. Wipe the board. And then they're going to play a 4-3 or a 5-4 if they don't have a land on top. They don't have a land on top, so 5-4 it is. But now we play a 6-6 against a 5-4. Bitter Triumph anything we have to get out of the way. Eclipse anything small enough to Eclipse. Do I have an Artifact in Grave this time? Yep, still have the Puzzle Door. I don't know why I thought it was gone now. It's still there.
Let's explore as well. Find the bomb rare? Okay. Snap keep. We did board wipe already, and they milled a 7-7 though, so currently the bomb rare is not a great card to cast. We get three, four creature, five creatures back. They get one, two, three, four, five creatures back. Yeah, maybe I should have actually milled that here. I mean, how much of what they get back would die to an eclipse versus how much of what we get back would die to an eclipse? So the scout would die to an eclipse. The siren would die to an eclipse. Two of their cards die to that. One, two of our cards when you count Sage of Days would die to the eclipse. Oof, now they've got a Cavern Stomper as well. Cavern Stomper does kind of make their board state big enough to make it super tempting to bring her of the last gift. So post bringer board state is going to be, I have a 6-6 six, six flyer. I have a 6-6, six, six, a 3-2, a 6-7, a 1-1 one, one death touch, a 5-6, a 4-4. Four, four. They have a 2-2, 1-2, 3-3, 7-7, 2-3. Two, two, three, three, seven, seven, three. I feel like we come out ahead there enough to just do it. And we don't want to attack in first and trade this off, because that just means they get another 7-7 seven, seven when I do that. I think this puts us ahead on board. cards left? Do I even mill two? Got the Descend 8 card here. Oh, let's... Mm, I kind of want to decline and just do the direct digging of the Sage of Days and the Surveil to have 8 in Grave. And then I choose exactly what I'm putting into the Grave. So, like, drawn to the Iceberg here. Probably. And this could be Mill Mill, which puts it at 8 in Grave. Yeah, sure. I guess that ends up just doing basically what the Marionette would have done. But we've got Descend 8. Let's see if they've got some solid interaction here. If they don't, I think we just start winning off the 6-6 six, six Flyer. And that's the, the game plan. A strange game of magic here. Not the greatest matchup for us. But we're doing things, sort of. Ooh, self reflection? Not a super heavily played card in the format. Just another big, expensive, powerful late game threat. Exactly not the kind of card we want to see. And there's the battle glyph to kill the flyer. All right. Well, fortunately, our bomber is not very well positioned against big late game creatures like our opponent's deck is jammed full of, it looks like. And we might actually mill out Start the draft off with the uh, the game where we mill out here. That I said could be a thing. Okay. Join the Dead is a good draw. Minus 10, minus 10 kills whatever we want. If I Eclipse, I lose a Marionette and a Sage, but they lose an Oaken Siren and a Scout, they lose better cards than we lose off of this Eclipse. And I can join the dead and bitter triumph in the same turn here. 
and then they're down to two cards in hand with a 2-3 and a 3-3 on board against all our big stuff. Yeah? I guess it's kind of tempting to use one in response to them flashing back the self-reflection, which would mean no attacks this turn. It's unfortunate I had to play my Swamp to cast both of these, because then I don't have something to discard and I have to pay the three. Yeah, I think I have to pass here so that I can use it in response to their self-reflection. And then start jamming in with all our stuff. Oh. Well, now I kind of have to use it in response to that. Dang it. We need them to not have all these six drops. What do I have left that I can draw into? Do I have any more interaction? Not really. Nah, I kind of drew it all. I mean, that's probably just enough now to win for them. I'm going to hold these still to go for the self-reflection counter. Or counter any of their removal spells, because it's probably green removal. Yeah, that works. Get some two-for-ones off of our removal spells. See, that's the kind of cards I want to see. Just a bunch of two drops. Eight cards left. Finding a flyer is very good. I need a black and two and a black and one. Hopefully I hit a land here. Even though I'd be down to seven cards. Sorry, didn't hit a land. But that's a fine card. If I hit a land, I could bitter triumph discard a land instead of losing three, which is kind of cool. Alright, now we counter the self-reflection and kill their 8-8. Does our flyer get to stick around? Then we have the smallest chance in the world here of grinding this thing out. Eight cards to go. I don't know if I even if I can even cast the iceberg here. <laughs> Currently, I kill them in... So they take four a turn, because one from Revenant and three from Scout. So I do kill them in... Uh, three turns. So I guess I can afford to draw a card. Probably should. Then I can slam down another 6-6 six, six and go for a go-wide attack on turn three of my attacks here. I'm going to draw the card pre-combat and see if our draw changes anything. Probably not. If it's the Visage, it will, but I think that's the only draw. 
That would change my plays here. Mill to Sager Days. Hit a dead weight. Dead weight is interesting. I don't think it changes anything for us, though. All right, we do have another iceberg in our grave, so I can flip this one, which is going to be the play. We do that post combat. I guess there is one interesting aspect of our our deck that we could toy around with, which is if we put in the five mana two five flyer that can dump things back on the bottom of library. Not only does that save us from milling out sometimes potentially. But if we have that plus the bringer, we can shove all of our opponent's creatures back into their decks. They don't get anything when we bring her. But that is still kind of narrow. Having it just for when we draw our bomb rare to be a really nice card. I might swap something out for it, though, because it does seem kind of cute. And that's most of what our deck is doing, right? Our deck's just kind of cute. So we could play around with it, maybe. Maybe cut one of the icebergs. Four icebergs does seem like kind of a lot. Another self-reflection which they could just instantly double up. They have 10 mana on board. They're going to have a big amount of stuff on the ground here, and they're going to scry four towards removal, which is awful for us. Because if they kill the Waterwind Scout now, we've got no plan, because they have so much on the ground. And they immediately hit exactly what they needed, scry both to the top instantly. Didn't even have to scry to the bottom to find what they were looking for. Probably game over for us. We'll see. I imagine Waterwind Scout is not long for this world, which means we have no plan to kill them in time. Oh no, that is the worst straw in my deck. Because I mill and draw, I'm down to two carbs left. But I do shoot them for one more damage, put them to 14, attack them with scout, put them to 11. Two more draw steps, hit for four each turn. We do not kill them fast enough. Also, I, I did the math wrong on how fast we're killing with the scout. Not that I think it is going to matter in the end. I think we sh still should have played the first iceberg, but we're definitely not playing another. What could I discover into? What do I have left? Visage? There's only one card I can discover into, so I know exactly what I hit. I just hit Visage. Rip a card out of their hand. A Nautilus and a land. All right, so their good cards are scryed to the top, which I can't interact with in any way. So here comes my death. Let's see what that scry to the top is here. I imagine it kills the scout. Otherwise, they take four a turn for three turns, which is exactly enough time. Discover off the cataract, which is the other card they scryed, which is a reach creature. Does not have death touch, though, so dead weight could work. Oh, but their other card is just like a fourth removal spell. maybe probably if they kept it on top it's at least like a reach creature yeah it's like their fourth removal spell they've cast this game gross and that does it now we mill out yeah our last two cards in our deck are just two more lands We do not get there, and our opponent's going to take forever, so let's just scoop it up and head into game number two, but I am going to swap out one iceberg 
for another flyer. That 2 5 thing that could maybe save us from self mill. We'll probably just always mill it though, because we have so much self mill that we could end up just putting that into our graveyard. So I guess we could. Maybe instead of the pilgrim, since our grave's gonna get so big, we could go for another chance. Um, and that gives us like a kind of a tutor effect late in the game where we pick up whatever we need out of our creatures. Not that we have the most flexible creatures ever, but it could like give us another bringer. Bringer twice in a row could be big. I mean, it'd be really weird because <laughs> then the whole board that we board wiped comes back for our opponent. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm going to cut an iceberg for another chance. And I think I'm also going to put the pilgrim in and we'll try out those two together. So then unless I mill both another chance and the pilgrim, uh, I won't. Uh, I won't mill out. And then I guess we ditch Fanatical Offering, because it's pretty similar to another chance where it's going to draw us two cards at instant speed later. This one, though, is, is much of a later game spell. I still think it's nice with the Pilgrim stuff going on or reanimating a bringer, picking it up in case we milled it. So I'm going to drop the Fanatical Offering. This gives us another chance to draw into Bringer of the Last Gift, even if we've milled it or something. So we'll do that little adjustment. And that should make our deck better against slower grindier decks which is kind of awkward because as i was saying earlier i don't think we're gonna face off against a lot of that it was just rough to immediately play round one against a slow deck full of six drops so now our matchup against decks like the first deck we played against is much better but our matchup against aggro decks is slightly worse. I still think we've got enough board wipes, though, for those kind of matchups that it'll probably pan out all right for us. So 0-1, heading into game two. And here we have that Eclipse if our opponent is on aggro, and if they're not, we have Sager Days to fill the grave and then another chance to pick up whatever we need. So I think the hand is pretty reasonable for most matchups here. Our opponent goes Island, Spyglass, Siren, one of the strongest cards in the format. Spectacular one drop. One mana, one one flyer that provides them a map token they can explore with to buff it up to a two two flyer and surveil one. Or to just draw another card, making it a one mana, one one that also drew them a card. Anything the map token does makes the uh, Siren incredible. And there's the Sunscribe opponent curving out on us here. Malicious Eclipse is probably going to have to just get cast turn three here to stop us from dying but it should be quite helpful. There's a Cave Crawler when we have a Sage of Days coming up. Uses a card draw engine. I do kind of like having the Water Wind Scout as well, though. And then we can another chance the Cave Crawler back. Yeah, I think Water Wind Scout is going to be a little, help, a little more helpful early. And then we pick up the Cave Crawler late once we've cleared the board to get several attacks off with it. So Sunscribe is a nice little combo with Explore cards, like their map token, because they can know exactly what's on top if they put that back on top. If they really want a non-land to get a plus one, plus one counter, then they can scry to the top if there is a non-land. And even if it's a card they don't want, they then get to use the map to put it into their grave and get a plus one, plus one counter somewhere. So there's a Water Wind Scout, and that is certainly a big enough board to just eclipse it up before they put any plus one, plus one counters on their two twos to save them from anything. There's another Waterwind Scout insane deck from our opponent here. Premium stuff all around. Now we will... Mm, I was going to say we can play our own and try to make it a 3-3 off our Explorer, but with three map tokens over there, theirs turns into a 5-5 five, five if they have a single card on top. A single non-land card. Because uh, they can just keep it on top each time. So they know they keep getting plus one, plus one counters. So. Kind of think I need to dig here for removal and use like a Sage of Days instead. Or I could just cash in the Skullcap Snail against their last card in hand and let them pop off with the Scout. I'm going to cash in the Snail here, rip their hand away. Looks like it's a five mana four, four. Yep, five mana four, four. Not a bad card to hit. I'll take it. 
And now we pray for bad hits off their explorer here. Either way, they are down to just one creature. Ooh, but the staunch crewmate, incredible two for one. A 2-1 on the board, draws them an artifactor, pirate. Finds a lodestone needle. Which doesn't do a lot right now, but it will be able to stun one of our blockers. And now all the exploring is going to dig them into some more cards. Hit a land here. They've got the courtyard. Oops. They've got the courtyard to discover with later. Knocked over my drink. Luckily, it had a lid on it. Yeah, so much value from double Waterwind Scout Spyglass Sire in this game. Yep, yeah, and there is the non-land card here, a Sunscribe that they're going to toss onto the bottom. We find a Brackish Blunder. I can put that back in their hand, get a map token, make them re-explore and try to buff it into a 3-3 again. But the fact that it does get to explore again when they recast it means it's not going to be the best value in the world to put it back in their hand. I still think it's probably fine here. Gives me time to set things up here with Sage of Days. Ooh. Now we're taking a Terror Tide to wipe the board again. When they draw into too much stuff. Or just immediately. So, see what they discover off the hidden courtyard. Inverted Iceberg. That's going to flip into a 6-6 six, six next turn. Which is not ideal. They do have to draw a 6th land to do that, I guess. But I think they can do that pretty consistently, pretty easily. Because they're drawing an extra card here and they're going to draw a card next turn. This is minus three, minus three. We want to get six permanents in Grave for Terror Tide, ideally. It will be a little while before I do it. So I could just blunder the scout. Yeah. So I'm say maybe I don't blunder the scout because I have a board wipe coming up and I want it to be on board to board wipe it, but I probably don't want a board wipe till they have a six, six and I have six permanents in Grave, which is going to be a little while from now, so let's set up for that at this point. And then we'll just another chance after the board wipe for whatever we need. So set up our own scout and start doing our own exploring. Fill that graveyard or draw some lands. Draw some lands it is. Not exactly what I wanted, but fine. 3-2 into the 2-1 just to get it off the board, get another permanent into my grave would be fine with me, because it gets our permanent count up towards getting to 6 with the Terror Tide, but they do not take the trade of the Sage of Days for the Staunch Crewmate. Alright, they've got plenty of cards over there, hopefully mostly creatures. Guide Mural is a creature, but it's also... A creature engine, it can just keep making 4-4s four every single turn as long as they uh, are spitting out artifacts. Let's iceberg and see what we hit. Well, I'm happy to have another chance here. They have one creature in their grave. We have one, two non-bringer creatures in grave if i mill enough off of another chance and sage of days kind of uh kind of cards here we can go wild with this another chance yeah let's do that sage of days we want to mill mostly creatures well this is all lands they are permanents for the terror tide I think we're getting towards some crazy stuff here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I do have enough mana to play the Bringer, but we are not going to be playing it next turn because it's not in my hand right now. I'm going to have to do another chance first. 
We would like to get more creatures into our graveyard before I do the bringer thing. So I'll go for the trade here to slow them down, get more permanents in my grave, specifically more creatures in my grave. There's a Master's Manufactory getting flipped on us here, which is their best card against our board wipes, unfortunately. And still just keep jamming in for all the onboard stuff for now. Still want another chance during their end step, ideally. I guess I could just flip a 6-6 six, six there. Hold up the bitter triumph. We do have that puzzle door in the grave for it. Would have been pretty fine. Send in both here. Hmm. I don't think I want to trade with the card that ends up in grave. Wait, what happened to the... Oh, they exiled the other card from their, their graveyard. Well, it's Chump here. It's highly unlikely they're running a counter spell. I don't even think most control decks in this format would run many. If any. In this set. In this format. There's the Waterwind Scout. Get a map token, which gives them a 4-4 off the Manufactory. Is this up to 2? Yeah, it's up to 2. So I could let everything else stay in the grave so that I can uh, reanimate more cards. Off of the bringer. Tishana's Tidebinder, so we need them to not have that in their hand when I play my bomb, which means I have to do it right now, because that'll counter the, uh, the enter the battlefield effect. Mill a spike tail. We just pick up the bringer. And we bring that last dawn. Oh, I should have attacked first. I could have gotten two damage out of this, because uh, they would choose not to block, so I don't have that thing in my grave to reanimate more stuff. Nobody's got haste this turn, so it doesn't really matter where I spike tail. They can just respond with their instant speed removal if they have it. 12 cards left. I don't have any more graveyard recursion. I've played my another chance, so I need to not choose to mill with the marionette. So that if we hit the flyer that saves me from self-milling, we can actually use it here. What do we get them to exile? Runaway Boulder, it looks like. I'll take the Revenant. And then off this one, keep the Revenant again. Is my Flyer going to be the last card? It's in the bottom seven, at least, at this point, guaranteed. I'm going to keep this land in hand to discard the Bitter Triumph if we need to. All right, let's see how they get out of this one. They have a solid board state for trying to grind things out. With that Manufactory, 
If they flip the Iceberg, they get a 6-6 and a 4-4 on blocks here. They also have the Lodestone Needle to tap and stun our Bringer for a while to save themselves from taking damage in the sky. So yeah, there's the Needle. It's gonna stun the Spike Tail. Which means they probably have hard removal for the Bringer of the Last Gift. To just fully exile it or pacify it or something like that. Just stun the second biggest creature instead. Yep, Petrify it is. To pacify it. And they still have that Enter the Battlefield effect counterer with the Tishana's Tidebinder. So they can counter the Revenants Enter the Battlefield effect, which I don't really want them to do. So I actually think I just flip an Iceberg instead. And they can't counter that. Effect. Um, could Bitter Triumph the 4-4 just to get some damage in here? I genuinely don't hate that. And then they just have a single 3-2 to block with. So they can trade into one of the Sages and take 3, 4, 5, 6 damage. Go to 7. Yep, flash that thing in. They could trade into the Cave Crawler if they want. Oh, they can counter triggered abilities too, not just enter the battlefield abilities. Okay, so we don't draw a card this turn. Wait. They could have killed the Cave Crawler, because it also got rid of its death touch there with the Enter the Battlefield effect. Which is kind of crazy. I didn't know it did that, and I guess our opponent didn't know either, but I did notice that it did. Well, I do want to draw that Pilgrim. So let's draw that Pilgrim. Just in case. You know, that's ah, oh, that's the kind of funny, kind of awkward part here. Now that we put the Hoverstone Pilgrim in to make sure that we don't mill out, it looks like we are going to actually kill our opponent right before we would have milled out anyway. Guess I don't get fantastic attacks in right now. I just send in the cave crawler. Yeah, no, I guess we need the pilgrim. Because we need to just draw enough cards for Revenant to kill them and we don't have enough left in the deck. We can't break through the 6-6 six, six, and 4-4 four, four here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I can use this ability twice the turn I play it, which is awesome. All right, never mind. It's not awkward. Hoverstone Pilgrim, actually incredible. The flying epitaph golem. Three cards left. There's an Oaken Siren, which means they get another 4-4. It's another artifact. They got them blocks ready. There's a Kellen for a 2-3 that maybe draws them a card every time it attacks. It surveils at worst. Let's just start shoving our best draws back on bottom of our deck. There's the concession. They see the ability go on the stack, and they're like, well, that is not going to be beatable. Because we're actually low enough on cards in our deck now that we can almost just use the Pilgrim to choose exactly what we're going to be drawing every turn, just in a couple turns. I mean, with Iceberg, to mill a card, draw a card, I draw one for a turn, then I play the Iceberg, and that's these three cards out of the way, which means literally next turn I'll just draw whatever I chose off the Pilgrim. And from then on, I can keep just drawing exactly what I choose each turn for my grave. So, all right. Well, 
we got there that time. I think that was just uh, mainly a better matchup for us. They did jam out a bunch of early game creatures. And as you can see, because of all these solid value enter the battlefield effects, with the crewmate drawing a card, the waterwind scouts getting those map tokens, the spyglass siren getting a map token, all that kind of stuff, even with like a really low, nice, aggressive curve with a lot of evasive stuff, this kind of decks in this format can still grind out like a really long game, which I think leaves these kind of decks just pretty far behind because like all they can do is grind out the long game. They can't like cheese out a quick early victory or anything like that. So yeah, even playing against a more aggressive deck that I think we're probably uh, a little better set up for, we were still almost getting outvalued at some points there and uh, and still just dying. So still a close, close game there for a little bit. Obviously turned around pretty well for us later when we found the bringer. But uh, yeah, I mean, solid stuff. Solid stuff in the end. I'm still having a lot of fun in this deck, even if I'm a little worried about its uh, its potential chances in future games. We'll see. I'll keep it up as best as I can as we head into game three, one and one. Here we are for game three. We have a Terror Tide that can at least give minus two, minus two, because Brine Fang and Spike Tail can end up in our grave no matter what. And if Iceberg hits the permanence as well, this will be minus three, minus three. So that's our plan against aggressive strategies here. Unfortunately, they are on the play, which is going to make us take a ton of extra damage here to where we might even die before we cast Terror Tide. It is entirely possible, believe it or not, to just die on turn three in this format on your turn three it would be their turn four here so as long as we don't die turn three we can probably terror tide all of their stuff soon let's iceberg first because we already have an island and a swamp we do hit a permanent that's good Ooh, and malicious eclipse is also good doesn't work against the shipwreck sentry but it'll probably kill pretty much everything else yeah, kills an Oaken Siren and a Tomb Raider here. Yeah, and I suppose I can't actually turn four Terror Tide for minus three, minus three, because I can only land cycle one of the two dinosaurs next turn. So I'll only have one more permanence in my graveyard by the time that I would want to Terror Tide. So we'll have to Eclipse and then just try to outrace a 3-3 three, three Sentry for a little while. Um, and then just go for a, a Terror Tide later. Well, never mind. Sage of Days is kind of the perfect draw here. Because now I can really fill the grave for the Terror Tide. Yeah, that's two more permanents. That's going to be three. And if the Sage of Days trades off, it's going to be four. Deadweight looks pretty good in this matchup. Visage could make sure they don't have anything left after a board wipe if I have time to get it out. But I have two board wipes here, so I don't really think I need to do that. And I guess Deadweight is just going to kill one of the creatures that Eclipse would kill, while Eclipse will kill all of them. So I guess... I don't know here. The, my problem with Visage is I think by the time I cast it, they're not going to have anything left in their hand anyway. Yeah, I'm just I'm going to take the Deadweight here as the draw. Right, because it's like next turn we're going to Terror Tide. And that's going to be after they play one or two more threats, probably this turn. And they'll have like one card left, maybe. And it might not even be a viable target. Oof. Removal for the 3-2, not great. Yeah, they literally have one card left. And it might not even be something that the, uh, the Visage can kill. And even if it is... If they play it this turn, then they'll have nothing in hand by the time that I would have played Visage. Oh my god, no. Zoetic Glyph. Well, that's horrific. Blunder's a pretty good draw, but they still get to discover three when I do this. So we need them to hit something I can deadweight or we're going to die. I guess I can do this next turn when they declare another attack. Yeah, when they declare another attack, I can... Oh, Lord. I can blunder. 
I kind of think I need to Swamp Cycle the Spike Tail so I have the mana to do Eclipse and Deadweight next turn if I need to, if they get another 4 Toughness card. Even though Spike Tail is the card I'm closer to casting than Brine Fang, I just think the third Black Source is a lot more important here. Well, on the plus side, Zoetic Glyph was not a card I could have hit with the... <laughs> The discard spell. So they can shoot me in the face for one. Well, shoot me in the face to put me down to one with this idol now. And there's a Tomb Raider. They find any haste and we're mega uber dead. Luckily I do get a blocker here. So now we're not dead to haste. Go to one from the idol. Oh, please tell me you don't have another burn spell. Please tell me you're just being mana efficient. Pirate hat. So now I have to play this entire game just hoping that they don't draw the burn. <laughs> All right, let's set up a draw with the map and flip a 6-6. Six, six. Wait. Oh, shoot. I was going to say, I don't know if I have an artifact in my grave. Oh, I do. I have the visage in there at least for sure. So yeah, we can flip that thing. Another chance? What do I have in grave here? Big dino, at least. Pick up a big dino in a Sage of Days. But I'm just going to spend next turn casting a Brine Fang anyway. I don't think I actually want that right now. Do I play around double Tomb Raider when they've already cast two? They'd have to have four in their deck and draw all of them by now. I'm not going to play around double Haster. But I'm going to hold up one blocker at all times. There's a Wanderglyph. Put a pirate hat onto it. It doesn't die to an eclipse now, and it will draw them a card next turn. Now I can start attacking with the Iceberg Titan because it untaps itself every time. Yeah, and I guess I can have two blockers up here again just by playing the Brine Fang this turn. I gotta try to kill them fast here, I think. I need to make it so it takes them as long as possible to find the burn spell. Well, not make it so it takes them longer to find it, but just kill them before they find it, you know? Give them as few opportunities as possible to draw more cards by just closing out the game quickly, because if they find another idol, we're dead. I do some digging for that burn. They're dead next turn. They had to have found it right now or they're dead. Moment of truth. Oh my god. Oh no, draw two more. They have exactly the mana for another idol. There's an Inti, which is just a 2-2. Two -two. That's dead on board. They're even more likely dead if I Eclipse here, I think, because that's eight, nine damage, yeah. And they have no blockers. Still nine damage and they have no blockers up this way. Please. Untap the ward blocker. Hogwork Wrestler. I think that would have saved them either way, because they get a chump. Yeah, they get a chump and stop two damage elsewhere. Still praying for that top deck haste creature, it looks like. 
They still have one more draw off the pirate hat for another idol of the Deep King. Put the 6 7 there, just in case there's some weird trample trick I'm not thinking of. There's the haster, but they're so dead on board. So I might as well. I mean, it doesn't matter. We'll just kill them here. I was going to say, I might as well put a card on the top. And there's the concession. Oh, that was stressful. That was a great little blue-red aggro deck with a super good curve, and they had the backup 5-4 after the board wipe. Put us down to one off that idol because we had to bounce that thing to deal with the Zoetic Glyph as a one-for-one. One. Whew. Scary, scary stuff, but we do find a victory against another really sweet deck from our opponent. We are now 2-1, and one, heading into game 4. And the 2-5 Ward Flying Dork played fine, <laughs> even in that game, where we didn't really use its ability at all. So maybe uh, maybe overhated that card early, but it's definitely not super, super premium. It's for very, very narrow decks, and this might actually be the deck where it's actually okay. Spicy stuff. Find a second victory. We are now at a positive win rate. Hopefully we can keep that up at least as we head into game number four. Here we are for game number four. The Brine Fang for the Island Cycler does make the hand keepable. It's still a bit sketchy, but I think I keep it here. We can deadweight their first threat. We can Iceberg for some value soon. Fourth Swamp is super redundant. Not what we wanted to see here, but... That'll happen sometimes. Okay. Let's just immediately get this dead weight out of the way to stop all of the early damage from the 3-1. Playing against the blue-white deck. There's the crewmate now. See what it finds. Finds an iceberg. Whoa, arena. Okay. Sixth swamp it is. Drop our first island this turn. Down to 18 from the crewmate. Now they drop a cloud guard. We gotta find one of our board wipes, ideally. Seventh swamp is not useful at all. Mill the second island, draw another iceberg. That's so sad. You know, if I hit a second island instead of a seventh swamp, then we could double iceberg that turn, and it would be pretty sweet. There is a join the dead. You can play a pilgrim and have a 2-5 to block the 3-2, but they kept all this mana up, which is probably for interaction. So it's probably best to just Iceberg join the dead, the 3-2. Because if they don't have Interaction in hand, or if they didn't have Interaction in hand, if they don't have something Instant Speed in hand, they would have just played the Iceberg. Alright, take 3 damage down to 9. And there's the Iceberg, mill 1 draw card. And I've unfortunately milled two islands here, and I need another to start flipping these as 6-6 six, six blockers, which would be ideal. Not only that, but if I had another island, I could play Scout plus Blunder, so we are getting hit very, very hard uh, with some just rough draws color-wise here, sadly. Alright, I think we have to run into their interaction this turn, and I guess I'd rather run into the interaction with a 2-2 two, two than a 2-5. They probably counter the Explore here, but we still gotta try. Yep, counter the Explore with removal. Yep. 
much better they kill that than kill our 2-5, at least. I guess I can just redraw it here. 9 life, facing 3 power on their board. The problem is they can flip an Iceberg. They will have to exile the 1-1 one, one to do that. I guess if they flip the Iceberg, we can blunder that. I think we do keep this awkwardly. Because next turn I can play Pilgrim and hold up Blunder, and we can blunder the 6-6. Six, six and have Pilgrim block anything else, if they attack with anything else. Sure, it's going to give them more card draw, because they get to recast it, draw another card, all that nonsense, but... It's what we can do to not die. There's the Petrify. It's going to be quite some time before they're actually attacking with that 6-6 again, so they might just play a different creature, and they do, another staunch crewmate. There's two mana, two, one, draw a card. Not even draw a card, draw like a guaranteed non-land, it's pretty nuts. <laughs> Unfortunately, Bringer's so much better for our opponent than us right now. Well... I think it's still better for them. I get one six seven. They get a three two flyer and a three one and a one one on the ground. Big yikes. Okay. All I can do is I bring her. Or I scout. If I scout, I'm dead to removal. If I bring her, I have two blockers against three attackers. And I'm still dead to removal, because if they kill my flying bringer of the dawn, and then they get in for three in the sky guaranteed, I can block the three one, but the one one hits me for one also. So whichever way I play, I'm dead to removal, but I, don't know, I guess blue white can kill any sized creature just as easily with petrify kind of cards. So I guess I play the smaller card and do some exploring then. Because it's unlikely that they have removal that would kill the scout, but not the bringer. There are some matchups, like against red decks and green decks, where it would probably just be better to play the bringer right here. Because they could have removal spells that would kill the scout, but not the bringer. But I don't think this is one of those matchups. I think most of the removal would bounce the scout or put it back on top or something, which would also hit the bringer. And I would die either way. If I do that. So at least this way I get to explore a little. Yeah. I play Bringer, they petrify, and I die. Rough stuff. Just some really, really bad mana there. We actually drew eight swamps and one island. I think we could have had a reasonable game there if we had hit the double blue. We would have been playing spells a lot better. We could have actually played two spells in one turn. And most importantly, something that put us really far behind here is without double blue, I'm down two six sixes this game. If we had one more blue source, we would have had two more six six blockers throughout the game, which is massive, massive stuff. So a couple of things went wrong there. We kind of need one of our board wipes against really aggressive decks like this. And even then, because there's so much card draw on cheap little aggro dorks in this format, even then it would have still been, you know, anyone's game. It would have been... Uh, been a hard-fought battle for sure, but yeah, we needed a cheap board wipe like the Malicious Eclipse or the Terror Tide. Or we needed to have a double blue light from the get-go. Not even from the get-go, just at a reasonable time. Getting nine lands deep with one blue source and eight black was really not where it was at, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, again, looking at the board, we had two more 6-6s six we could have deployed as big blockers with another blue source. We'd still be behind for sure, but we almost definitely could have lasted a couple more turns. And seeing that we drew into Bringer of the Last Gift, a couple more turns might have been all it would have taken if we could find like a Sage of Days or something to really get there. But just not our game there.
We are now 2-2, two and two, heading into game 5. Here we are now for game number 5 on the play. Puzzle door to fill the grave and search for what we want. Cave crawler into revenant. Probably get that descend 4 from the revenant after playing the cave crawler. This could be pretty nice. I guess we'll have to send three at most. Maybe won't have the cave crawler, crawler going immediately, but I like this hand on the play. Still looks pretty strong. There's their own puzzle door. Ooh, we find the bringer to wrap things up. Once we have filled that graveyard, find a malicious eclipse versus a join the dead. The only information we have is island and puzzle door, and these are cards that blue white and blue red would play as well, and those are both decks that'll flood the board with creatures. But the problem is blue black would also play it, and that's a grindier deck where join the dead would be better. Eclipse is better against blue white and blue red. Join the dead, better against blue black. I'm going to take the Eclipse here. So we've got a nice early board wipe if they try to aggro us out too quickly. And the nice thing about it is it exiles everybody, so they won't have stuff in grave for the bringer. If they are blue black, we're going to have a really bad matchup. Bringer of the Last Gift is horrible in a mirror match because they're just going to fill their graveyard. But we found the Hoverstone Pilgrim, which we were talking about being a combo with the Bringer where we can use this to get all the creatures out of their grave before we cast Bringer of the Last Gift. So maybe that's going to happen here. Maybe that'll be the game plan. For now, I'm going to put the Cave Crawler on board because it survives Malicious Eclipse. So we can get this on the board. Maybe get them to commit some more creatures to the, the board without being too suspicious because we're still playing stuff. I mean, even the Revenant, we can just jam out and it won't die to the Eclipse. Oh, yeah. So that's two cards they have that'll die to Malicious Eclipse. If I wait any longer, though... This thing could become a 3-3, a three, three, because this end step, it's going to be a 2-2. Two, two. I think I'm just going to Eclipse now before this becomes a 3-3 three, three and is out of range of, uh, of my Eclipse here. Yeah, because then also they could, like, sack it in response, maybe, if they have the mana left over. So let's just exile these things. Just get rid of that nonsense. I suppose I could have poked them for one, probably. They probably wouldn't block there. But I wouldn't draw a card or anything, so. Might matter, though. One damage can be the difference between a win and a loss. But we probably should have chipped in for one. They're not going to have haste creatures to hold up the cave crawler to block. Alright, there's a big old frilled cave worm here. We get a tapped land towards the pilgrim. So we play the revenant now. Mm. Better than Sage of Days right now. If I Sage of Days and I can get the full four, I can attack with Cave Crawler, draw a card, and trade it into Cave Worm. I'd have to get pretty lucky here because I do have more instants and sorceries in the deck, but two of them are already in the grave, so maybe we'll hit three permanents. I'm going to get a little greedy here. I'm going to try to get the send for Cave Crawler. Ah, oh, didn't get there. Didn't get there, but I will take. Huh. Hold up. I've got an 8 drop in my hand. Do I take the Swamp over the Blunder? I was going to say, I could just take the Blunder here since it's not adding to Descend at all. That's like, I might as well. But I kind of do need more mana to get to the 8 for the Bringer eventually. I don't know. I think Blunder should play pretty fine in this matchup. And I'm going to spend a bunch of time dirtling around with Pilgrim before I even want to cast the Bringer anyway. Because we don't want them to have big stuff like Cave Worm in their grave. So I'll take the, the Blunder here. I don't know, it actually doesn't fit in the curve super well. Maybe I should have just let it all get milled.
Yeah, no, I guess with these two coming up, I'm not fitting a blunder in here anywhere. Unless I play Pilgrim next turn, then I top deck a land after that. Song of Stupefaction on the Cave Crawler. Well, it can still draw me a card every time it attacks. If they don't hold up good blocks for it. Which, let's, let's descend four. There's my fourth permanent. Show me the good blocker. They don't show me the good blocker. Let's just draw a card. Unless they spend two removal spells on this thing. Okay. We draw the card. Ooh, and we hit a Swamp Cycler, which is beautiful because we want more lands. And that puts another creature in grave for the bringer of the last gift. All right. Now we see if they have that uh, three mana counter spell, but if they don't, Starving Rev should be awesome. Looks like they do not. Three, four, five, six. I do need land seven and eight. Don't know if I want to take six damage to get both of them. Let's just take the... Let's take the island here. Let's draw one of these. Take three. Join the dead. Goodbye, Revenant. So now we have seven mana, so we know we can play the Pilgrim and the Blunder in the same turn. There's their own Revenant. So we play a Pilgrim, we hold up a Blunder. If we don't end up casting the Blunder, we use the Pilgrim to start clearing out their graveyard. How's our graveyard looking? Revenant, Spike Tail, Sage, Brine Fang. Oh yeah, Bringer the Last Gift is a win condition and a half. Sage of Days, if I want to fill my grave up more, but I think I would rather... Get some stuff out of theirs, so if I top deck one land, we're just playing the bringer next turn. And we actually probably send in the cave crawler again, because we draw a card and then if they block and kill it, it's in the grave for the bringer. I could chump block and then it's in the grave for the bringer as well, but I want to draw land eight, so I do want to dig a little. Skullcap Snail. Hmm. That is not land eight, which I don't like. But now I could play Snail and Sage and Blunder and have four power of blockers up to double block the Revenant if they go for an attack with that. Plus I rip one of the only two cards out of their hand. I guess we wait on the bringer a little longer then. Yeah, I, I like having Snail plus Sage plus Blunder here. Pretty nice. Got rid of there. Turn something to a 1-1 one, one, one with no abilities. Not a bad card to get rid of. Now Sage of Days. Put two creatures in my grave and a land in a... Well, not in the hand, but onto the top. So we have eight mana next turn. Not that I'm gonna bring her next turn. But now we have enough for when we are going to cast Bringer. They only have four creatures in their grave. We might not even have to get rid of all of them before we cast our Bringer for it to be good. I'm just going to blunder this thing to slow them down, because it doesn't have an enter the battlefield effect or anything. I don't really want to blunder a revenant, obviously, because then they just draw two more cards. So I can play the pilgrim, I can put one card on the bottom, and I can also explore. So I can see if I can make Sage of Days big enough to single-handedly trade into Rev. 
which is cool. I could also just make the Pilgrim a 3-6 maybe, but it's already big enough to block either of these without dying, and I think it's already my biggest threat on the board, like the biggest target for removal here. Another land. Not terrible. Oh, I guess I should have done that during my turns. So they didn't have to send eight anymore. We could have stopped one more point of damage. But we're threatening like a brackish blunder, I guess. By holding the two mana up. Threatening to have another instant speed little trick. What is their best creature in Grave right now? Probably Tide Binder. I actually don't know how the abilities would stack up. I think all our abilities would go on the stack first, and then theirs would, and they could respond. Well, that's frustrating. Instantly have the join the dead. So I, I can only kill one thing. I can only stop one thing from coming back here. I think I get rid of the Tide Binder, because I just I'm not 100 percent sure how this is gonna work. I mean, it obviously doesn't stop the bringer of the last gift, but do I have any good abilities that would stop? That would trigger on Enter the Battlefield? Starving Revenant, I guess. You know, I don't hate them stopping like a Starving Revenant trigger. That's probably fine. So let's make sure they don't get a 2-2 flyer then. Their best flyer we get rid of. One of their map tokens. There is no counter spell in this format for one and a blue. So, boom. Yeah, they do get to counter whatever ability they want here. So I guess they probably counter the Skullcap Snail since that's in the grave now. So they can keep their last card in hand. Maybe they still counter the Revenant. I don't know. I don't even want to look through this pile and find what they're targeting at this point. Just let it happen. There's not anything I can do to interact with it anyway. Alright. I will not mill two cards. They didn't counter the Skullcap Snail, so we did exile a thing. Sage of Days, do we want to keep one of these? Another chance, probably. Don't hate the dead weight, but I'll take the another chance here. Could explore and then I reveal another chance. I don't really want to reveal it. Alright. Well, this looks like a winning position. What did they exile again? A death cap marionette or an island? I think it was the island. I think this is the newest discard. The newest card in their exile. Alright. They're going to dig with their own map token. Things are looking kind of okay when you look at the board. I think we'll be fine. But you never know. Um, now we just keep using Pilgrim over and over. This looks good. This looks good. This looks good. This is fine. This is fine. This is fine. Boom. Plenty of blockers here. Yeah, they're just going to scoop them up, and that is going to be 3 and 2, officially at least a 50-50 win rate with this one. It's been a super fun deck, so I'd like to try to keep it up. It's also been a pretty long, pretty grindy one, so it's been a lot of magic so far. 
We are three and two, getting at least a thousand gems back out of the 1500 gem event. Hopefully winning at least one more game here so we can get to that break even point, but we'll see how far we can take it as we head into round number six. Round six, another awkward hand mana wise. We're going to have some pretty big issues if we don't hit a second to Black Source, but the Spike Tail is the first one. We have the Eclipse against Aggro. We'll have to play it turn four at the soonest, though. I think I still keep and hope for the best here. One Black Source is all we need to draw. And there's a Puzzle Door to help do it. Playing against a green deck, though, and they have the Dinosaur Avatar, so it's probably a bunch of giant creatures is not a great matchup for us, and I think green-blue is also one of our worst matchups. That was the first deck we got crushed by, and I think the reason is they have big green creatures that survive a lot of our board wipes, and they have um, a bunch of blue just card advantage to not fall behind. We do have our bigger board wipe now, our Terror Tide as well, that might work against some big dinos later naturally draw a swamp so we will have double black here guaranteed if we use the spike tail for now i can go ahead and marionette and use the puzzle door so i can mill two and then i can draw whatever i want out of the top two as well and start fueling our terror tide hit two more permanents there we go that is some fuel for the descend stuff and milled an iceberg for our other iceberg so we have craft fuel but i already have the puzzle door for craft fuel so there's that didact echo gonna be pretty good in this matchup draws a card when it hits the board and a 3-2 body does matter against us Ooh, starving revenant over the swamp here kind of have to the card is very good we won't be casting it next turn most likely but we will be in the future thanks to our spike tail so, yeah, we got a cash in the spike tail here for another black source. Oh, I don't know why you would double blue that, but... Okay, then. Got marionette on blocks for didact echo. Yeah, I prefer going blue and black there and then playing a swamp, so I have a blue and a black untapped, and it's less easy for them to try to play around stuff at instant speed. There's a lot more cards it can be if we have one man of each color. Obviously, the auto tapper just sees that we have a bunch of double black spells in hand. It's like, oh, I got a whole double black up, but we can't even afford them anyway, so might as well threaten some other stuff. That would be really complex, though, for them to design the auto tapper to consider that kind of stuff. So, four mana, or sorry, six mana, four, four flyer, no other text. That is fine with me. Do I just want a two-for-one Terror Tide here? Not even a two-for-one, because we lose the Marionette, so we do lose a card as well. I'm probably just going to play a Starving Revenant and then play a Join the Dead on the Council of Echoes if we need to. I think I'm still chilling like the Visage here quite a bit. Sage, not so much. We can ditch that. Now I have a 4-4 to block a 3-2, so I guess we send in the Marionette for one. I suppose they'll probably just removal spell the 4-4, though, if they have one. But then they're getting back into a position where we can just Terror Tide. Right, if they spend resources into killing our cards and play some more of their own, Terror Tide would not be bad. So Clay Fired Bricks, they only have one planes in the deck, though, so just gains two when it hits the board, and they have to draw into a treasure token to flip it. Or a mana dork to flip it, so that's fine. Okay, let's visage and see exactly what's going on in their hand here. Could flip the iceberg instead, but I want to see what they're doing right now. Weird. All right, they're running the four mana counter spell then. Well, we got that out of the way, so it can't hit our 
Terror Tide if we need to cast that. And now we're going to start hitting them for four a turn and draining them for a life every turn. Since we have eight permanents in Grave. That should help try to win the current race. To draw two from Chart, of course. There's an Econ Zeal Current Conductor, which helps all of their Explorer abilities be a little stronger. Another land, two cards in their hand here. Again, if they ever blow up Revenant with a removal spell, we just board wipe. And if they don't, probably just try to keep draining them out with that. There's something. Ooh, double explore to buff up that council and the Neekin Zeal. All right, well, those are scary enough now. We probably have to Terror Tide here. I could still join the dead on the council and hold up Marionette to block the Neekin Zeal with Death Touch. And then we can board wipe after they play the River Herald Guide as well. Suppose that's probably fine. Yeah, I'll do the Join the Dead. Do it while they're tapped out because they do seem to be running counter spells. Lodestone Needle, lock down the Death Toucher here. Well, I'm about to board wipe anyway, so here is a chump block from the Starving Rev. Now they are out of cards. I guess they can start exploring every turn with the Lodestone Needle if they craft that. Uh, but if they don't have any creatures on board, they can't do any exploring. So we're going to Terror Tide it up. And start dropping our own threats. Yep, Cave Crawler is an awesome draw because it gives me something to cast immediately rather than having to wait to flip the Iceberg into a 6 6. We can just immediately have this thing attacking, and then we'll have the 6 6 after that. Go crazy from there. Yeah, they don't draw to a creature. They've got nothing right now. They did draw to a creature, so they get to explore twice. One from entering the battlefield and one from the Lodestone Needle. Just exile their bricks to the Needle if they don't have an artifact in Grave. And they don't have an artifact in Grave. They don't want to do it. Don't want to exile their bricks here. They're waiting for uh, another white source somehow. Okay, well, could blunder the axe draw, but I'm okay with the trade. We still draw one kill a 5-4 here, and then just drop a 6-6. Six, six. Well, I guess the more cards I get to draw here, the better, so sure, we'll blunder that. Now we get at least two pieces of card draw off the Cave Crawler, which is pretty big. Get rid of the Puzzle Door from our Graveyard. To craft the Iceberg Titan. Waterwind Scout is what they find off the River Herald Guide. So it's going to stick around because the card is great. They have to double block to kill Iceberg Titan. They can one for one the Cave Crawler, but we draw when we attack with it. Send in. Find a Hidden Cataracts. Best land to draw here, since we can explore with it later. Take it all, says our opponent. Alright, they're down to 8 life. And here's another 6-7. Beefy board state here. I guess they can craft using the map token from the Waterwind Scout to flip their Lodestone Needle now. So they can start exploring every turn instead of just once. They still don't want to do that, though. This needle's never getting flipped. 
Oh, nope, they are just going to use the bricks. Explore again, find another land. We're definitely winning on board. Do I eclipse right now? I kill both of these. They only have one blocker left. They block a four power creature, take one, two, three, four. Yeah, they have to block a four power creature, so they have to chump if I eclipse here. Yeah, eclipse is great. They have to chump. And we get to draw another card for free then. Yeah, they're going to concede from that. We are now four and two. Guaranteed to be at least breaking even here, which is awesome. Getting our 1,400 gems out of the event. And it's been a pretty fun deck with some real grindy games. We are over the two-hour mark in this recording session now. Here we are for game seven with a definite keep. Our opponent is on the play, so we'll be a little on the back foot here, but with a dead weight for their first threat, and then a water wind scout and a stinging cave crawler for some nice early plays. I think we've got a solid plan for starting this game off. Our opponent is on probably blue-white. Red-white, starting with a market gnome here. So if they craft that away or sacrifice it to something, they gain a life and draw a card. If they chump block with it, they gain a life draw a card. Red-white, a pretty aggressive archetype generally, but looks like they don't have anything but an 0-3 for now. Let's get our Waterwind Scout down, I think. Because even if they removal spell it, we get to keep that map token around. Whereas if I play a cave crawler and they braid it or something, be a little more sad. We get no value off the card. There's a Cartographer's Companion for a 2 1 and a map token. There's a Skull Cap Snail for the draw. Probably just going to use the map token and cast a cave crawler here. Let's see. If we buff the scout, we do buff the scout, and Visage of Dread's a good draw. Don't hate that at all. We'll have five mana next turn, which means I can Visage and then hold up Join the Dead, if it looks favorable to do so. Because we do have triple black in this hand. Really nice mana this game, making up for some of those awkward uh, one blue source or one black source games we've had earlier. So the map token does find them their fourth mana here. Another mountain. And they do have blue as well. They're blue, white, and red. And there is the saw blades to kill the Waterwind Scout. And they can craft that with the gnome to gain the life draw card, which is solid value. So let's see what's going on in their hand with this visage. They do have an Abuelo, which is pretty insane with all of their Enter the Battlefield effect artifacts, like the Spring-Loaded Sawblades and the Magmatic Galleon as well. Magmatic Galleon is also just a busted card in general. It's a removal spell that also makes a treasure token and leaves behind a giant vehicle. So this is a terrifying hand, and I can only rip one of these cards away. I think I have to just hit the Abuelo so they don't get to repeatedly abuse a Magmatic Galleon or uh, a Sawblades or something. Well... Actually, I'll rip the Galleon, because I can I can kill Abuela with a dead weight. Just paying some extra mana, so let's actually rip the Galleon out of there. Yeah, and then Join the Dead's not going to work, because their card has Ward here, so we just play Skullcap Snail. Get rid of their Mountain, I guess. That is our play for turn. Guess I might as well send in Cave Crawler, I suppose. Since I'll have a 1-1 one, one to block the 2-1. Yeah, I mean, they can get like a Menace swing in thanks to the Dynatomaton. They're just going to cash in the Gnome, gain a life draw card. That is fair enough, since they can just craft it from the Grave as well. Yeah, they don't draw the card again by crafting it from Grave, but... They do get to cash in that card draw earlier here. So Skullcap Snail, pass from there.
we're gonna get the Dynatomaton out of the hand, so solid value from Skullcap Snail. Trades up into the 4-3, and there's Abuelo. They only have double red up, so I doubt they get to save Abuelo here, but we'll see. Looks like a no to me. Third permanence into my grave by discarding this Brine Fang. Kind of just need to do it in general anyway, even if it doesn't get me to a high enough descend. Just need to play my land for turn. Now that we've got an 8 drop to get to, and we've got a 6 drop on board with the Visage, I do have two creatures to craft for it. I'd probably rather exile the snail from the board and something from grave. Ooh. If they let me put the snail in grave, I'll happily craft it from the grave instead. I also have full descend for the cave crawler, so we attack with that first, then we craft with the visage. If they want to trade into it here, I'm fine. We draw a card and clear out the potential discover enabler with two caves on their board. Three caves on their board to pop off with. Uh, with all those caves on their board, we might go Iceberg and just join the Dead the Curator instead for the turn. Yeah, I think that's probably fine. Save Bitter Triumph for the next threat. That was a very good draw. Anim Pakal, big bomb, but we've got removal spells for that. And luckily they don't do any attacking this turn, so they don't get to immediately get a counter and some gnomes. Flip the saw blades. Terror Tide is the draw. They're never going to block our cave crawler here if we attack, so let's draw our card before I do anything else, I think. Um... So if it's something expendable, we can discard that to Bitter Triumph, but we're probably paying three here. Yeah, lands are not exactly expendable with an eight drop in hand, so. Triumph. Neem. Revenant. We're at 15. I could just draw both the cards here. I'll draw the Puzzle Door. I'm not going to cast... Oops, <laughs> I should have cast Puzzle Door here. But I'm not going to cast Bringer the Last Gift right now. I think their grave is actually just better than ours. Um, so we're not going to try to play Bringer unless we draw into our card that puts their stuff back on the bottom. Rumbling Rock Slide kill the Revenant here. Not a bad discover. They could kill the Cave Crawler instead since it's drawing me a card every single turn. But the Revenant would be hitting them for more damage, so a little bit of a hard choice for our opponent. Thousand Moons crack shot. Not really worried about that, but it does uh, accrue their 5-5, five, five, which is bad for me. Yeah, we're down to 7. i got to establish some solid blocks for that 5-5 five, five thing. Got enough mana to use the Puzzle Door and flip the Iceberg in the same turn. This also gets Rev to descend 8 until I exile something from Grave. Still don't think I'm using Bringers, so I'm actually going to draw the Spike Tail to cast it here. I guess I cast that instead of flipping an Iceberg. Since that keeps me at my full descend. To start gaining life off of Revenant. And I don't think I can attack here because the Thousand Moons crack shot could tap something on an attack. Right, if they hit another creature or some more artifacts to crew the chariot, then they attack with a 5-5 and a 2-2 and tap the spike tail and I take 7. But if I hold Revenant up, I get to block and kill the 2-2 and go to 2 if they do that. And they can probably just crack a cave to discover any creature to crew the chariot because it's crew for only one, which is nuts.
they discover another rock slide. Two for two on very, very solid discoveries here. Wouldn't be surprised if they kill the Revenant now that it's doing life drain, but they are going to kill the Spike Tail. So they can attack with the 5-5. Five five. Break through the Revenant here. We die to a combat trick here. Two, three, four creatures in their grave. We'll have one, two, three, four, five, six in our grave, but they've got some like rares in there. I don't think we're like blocking and board wiping. Go to two, but we go up to three. We can flip blockers off of Iceberg or Visage. Fourteen cards left. Here's a six six, I think. For the play. And that has vigilance on attacks, which is massive. Vehicles are so good. The fact that I can't kill this thing with my board wipe is hurting me so much here. There's a clay-fired bricks, which is going to be massive. That gives them two more creatures and gives the whole board plus one, plus one. That's going to be terrifying. They definitely have the seven mana for it in a moment. To tap two other artifacts, yeah. To... Crew the Chariot, so no attacks this turn at least. Well, there's the Eclipse for their 2-2, I guess. That is something. We're at 4 life. I can spend 5 of this 8 mana to use Cataract and 3 of it to Eclipse. Four life. Probably just one chariot attacking me, but I die to removal if I only have one blocker, and I don't know if Cataract is going to hit a creature specifically, so I think I have to only attack with one creature so I can have all my blocks up. We know they can crew the chariot when they flip the bricks. Guaranteed. I guess if I wait on Eclipse, then I'll have it left over to kill all the gnomes too, alongside the crack shot. Still kind of think it's safer to kill the crack shot here. I'll still have a terror tide. If I really need to board wipe again. I guess I could decide based on what I discover, or I could get a 5-4 to have three blockers up. Let's get the 5-4, I think. Because then I have three creatures that are all going to survive the minus two, minus two. I guess once the bricks are flipped, though, then the crack shot won't die to the bricks anymore. I probably should have milled two since ref's down to seven now. Shoot. Yeah, I think I'm going to Eclipse just a lone crack shot here. Before it turns into a 3-3. I should have milled off the Osseosaur for sure. Flying Restless Anchorage. Put me to two. Is the play. Oh, come on. Idol of the Deep King to shoot me for two.
really disappointing way to end it. We had that game so locked out if they didn't have threats that just can't be board wiped. They have a vehicle and a man land turns into a creature during their turn only. One point of life off from surviving. We wouldn't have gained another life there from the Revenant if I had milled myself with Osseosaur, because we didn't like draw a card alongside the Osseosaur that turn. So even if I did the self mill where Rev was still at eight, we'd still be at four life there. But maybe there was somewhere earlier in the game we could have stopped one extra point of damage. Yeah. Vehicles and creature lands. Without the chariot, I think we could have won that game a long time ago with the double board wipe. But just having these kind of threats that survive board wipes and stick around to attack later. It's super rough for us. Their deck's also insane card quality. Their draft pod just shoved in a Neem Pakal Abuelo Magmatic Galleon just right into their little, little hands there. We got some big bombs as well, but they're in the weakest color in the format and a very slow, grindy archetype in an aggro format, which means you are going to see these cards a lot later, a lot more often. Plus, I think we, like, picked these really highly as well, so I guess we did get lucky to, like, open them. But I think they're all worse cards because they're in worse color pairs and much less aggressive. Yeah. High card quality from our opponent and having the threats that are resilient to board wipes really crushes us there in the end. And even then, still got really close. They were at 9 against 15 power on the board. So I'm sure there were some other more aggressive lines that could have killed them, but going for other more aggressive lines would have made us dead to them having some other spells potentially, like Daring Discovery to shut off all our blocks or something like that. I don't know. Rough one to end it. Four and three is going to be the final record for this deck, and that's about what I would expect even from a very solid kind of blue-black descend deck. I think the deck was pretty good. We had some rough mana issues to lose a game. Obviously, cards that are resilient to board wipes are also rough, but as you can see from just the way a lot of those games played, there are just so many great one, two, three mana value creatures that hit the board really aggressively while still drawing you extra cards later, like all the map token producers of Water, Wind Scouts, Spyglass, Sirens, and stuff like this, that these slower blue-black, black-green, descendy kind of archetypes and just just control to mid-range decks in general in this format do fall a little flat, unfortunately, to where, honestly, 4-3, and three, I think, is a respectable record for this, uh, this kind of archetype. It's a little disappointing, a little um, depressing if you look over the 17 lands data and just see how low win rate Black's cards are compared to uh, blue, red, and white, even for stuff that looks like really, really powerful cards and stuff. Just because the color just does so much slower kind of decks that just don't pan out super well in the format, as we saw today. Still a cool deck, still did some fun stuff, still got way more gameplay than we bargained for. A lot of value for our buck in terms of the time spent playing Magic. <laughs> that was two and a half hours of recording, and we got all our money back with 1,400 gems, so that's pretty cool. But generally, an archetype I would avoid in the best of one cues. Now, best of three is a different story where you can do a lot of deck editing between rounds and stuff. You can side in those malicious eclipses because we had them against some grindy green blue decks where they were pretty bad. So we got hit pretty hard there. So being able to side in and out certain cards does benefit these kind of decks Quite a bit more than aggro decks generally because those aggro decks are kind of going to have the exact same game plan use all the same tools between games but these kind of decks can run a lot more silver bullet kind of cards that you can pick up later during the draft so you have some things that are really good against specific archetypes which is nice like we saw with our like braided net that we ended up cutting out um we could pull that in against decks with single standalone creatures and stuff so i think it's a cool archetype it's a decent archetype in best of three in traditional draft if you're at FNM and stuff like that. But I'd probably avoid it just going for the ranked ladder in premier drafts and quick drafts and the like. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. 
If you enjoyed this video and you're interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below, and if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.